Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our first of this season. Uh, coming up to then, in January, we're going to be reading The Birds That Audubon Missed by Ken Kaufman. And then in April, we're going to be reading The Big Year. And we're also going to suggest that people watch the movie and we can talk about both of them. If you haven't read the book, I hope you will find um, the discussion to be of interest. And as we go along, if you'd like to um, share your ideas and your comments, you can ask to, um, you can unmute yourself and ask Nancy to call on you, or you can add something to the chat box. So our author is Stephen Moss, and he is, um, from England. He's from Somerset, as you can see, it's marked there on the map. And he is a, a naturalist, a prolific author, over 30 books. Uh, he's a speaker. His main role was as a BBC TV nature producer, especially in the late 90s and the early 2000s. But now he's moved into more writing and teaching. He does radio too. So, he does start off by talking about just what is it about birds? And I'd, I'd just like to ask people too, what do you think? What is it about birds that uh, is so fascinating for us? Uh, some of the things we have here are that they can fly and that they, they can sing and maybe the way they take care of their babies and the nests that they make. But anybody have a comment they'd like to make? Lily Durflinger mentions it says, she says uh, that they seem so free. Oh, yeah. I'm going to make a comment. I, you know, everybody I think has their spark bird, especially if you go out birding, something that, that just attracted you to birds and and birding in general you know it could have been a a brilliant colored bird it could have been something common like a robin it could be something it's but i think a lot of people have that that spark bird that that gets them started do you have mm -hmm. a spark bird drina i do it's the red-headed woodpecker Anybody else? Uh, Matt mentions they're very photogenic. So yeah, oh. lots of lots of folks take photos yeah. of birds. Okay. Well, the title of this book is 10 Birds That Changed the World. And it comes to mind, have birds really, really changed the course of human history? Or have humans change the course of bird history. Well, Moss would say, absolutely, they've changed the course. And after this discussion tonight, I'll ask you what you think. So some of the things that Stephen Moss uses to answer his question about the title is he looks at just the cumulative effects of how birds influence us, some specific events about birds, some tipping points where something about what was going on with humans and birds made a difference. There have been some paradigm shifts, which we'll talk about like with evolution, and then even some social revolutions related to the plume trade in the 19th century. The way Moss has uh, organized his book is into 10 chapters. Each chapter is devoted to primarily one bird. There's one chapter that talks about all of, quote, Darwin's finches, unquote. And then he has an aspect of humanness, humanity, one word 
that he explores in each of these chapters. So you can see here, for the raven is mythology, for the pigeon it's communication, turkey, food and family, the dodo extinction, Darwin's finches evolution, the guane cormorant, agriculture, snowy egret conservation, bald eagle politics, Eurasian tree sparrow hubris, and the emperor penguin, the climate emergency. It's kind of nice to have this kind of a, an idea or a theme to work with in each chapter, but all of these words overlap with, with each bird that he talks about. And since we're in a, such a political season right now, I can just say too that there's politics involved with every single bird that, that uh, he talks about. Well, let's start with chapter one and the raven. Um, and the main theme here is mythology. And the raven, this is the common raven, uh, one of 46 species in, in the uh, genus of Corvus. And we have here the range of the common raven in, in the light purple. So it's quite extensive, mostly in the Northern hemisphere, but then in uh, far South America too. And I'd just like to take a minute to read the very beginning of the book, uh, the first chapter. And um, it's quite a wonderful way to start the book. As dusk was falling on an early autumn day, a woman was working outside her home in Boulder, Colorado on the Colorado River. Yet she was finding it hard to focus on the task at hand. Close by, a large black bird was uttering a constant chorus of loud, raucous cries. The bird was a familiar one, a raven, but his behavior that afternoon struck the woman as very odd. However much she tried to ignore it, the raven's calls were getting louder and more persistent. As later she recalled, it was putting on a fuss like crazy. In exasperation, she looked up as the raven passed directly over her head. It landed on a nearby rock just above where she was standing. Only then did she realize why the bird was behaving so strangely. Among the rocks, barely 20 feet away, an animal was crouching, a cougar, staring directly at her with its piercing yellow eyes. The beast, weighing over 50 kilograms more than the woman herself, was about to pounce. At less than five feet tall, she was about the size and weight of a deer, the cougar's usual prey. So if it did attack, she would at the very least be badly wounded. At worst, she would die. The woman rapidly backed away from the cougar, calling out in fear. Her husband heard her panic cries and arrived on the scene, scaring the predator away. After she had recovered from the shock, the woman spoke about her narrow escape. She was in no doubt about what had happened. That raven saved my life. The news media declared her survival to be little short of a miracle. But let us take, take a step back for a moment and focus not on the thoughts and feelings of the woman, but on the instincts and motives of the bird itself. Why would the raven want to warn her against a potentially fatal attack? And if there is no satisfactory answer to that question, what is really going on here? Since prehistoric times, wolves and ravens have worked together to find food, sometimes cooperating too with human hunters, at other times with mammalian predators. Ravia ravens are too small to kill prey as large as a deer, something only wolves or humans and cougars could do. But compared with the raven, these large terrestrial mammals lack one major advantage. They cannot fly. Only the raven can reconnoiter a large area of ground, locate potential prey, and then return to guide the hunters toward the target. If the hunters succeed in making a kill, they will fe feast on the animal's flesh. But when they are done, they leave the remains behind with enough meat on the bones for the ravens to scavenge a hearty meal. So while we might wish to see the raven's intentions as benign, 
Isn't the opposite likely to be the case? Is it not far more probable that the raven was intentionally luring the cougar towards the woman, hoping that it would succeed in making a kill? Then both the cougar and the raven would have feasted to their heart's content. For me, this was new information about ravens. I did not know that they worked that way. And I found it uh, just rather amazing to learn that. Um, with mythology, uh, there are many instances of how the raven is part of ancient mythology. The Pacific Northwest indigenous peoples, they saw the raven as creator of the world. They kept, he kept secrets. The raven was a shapeshifter and fiercely independent. Ravens have a certain intelligence too that adds to their mythology. They do have a skill too, it's called displacement, in that they are able to let other ravens know where a carcass is without actually going there themselves. They can tell the other raven somehow where it is. If you've read The Hobbit, you know that there are ravens, the uh, Roak and Kark. I have not watched the Game of Thrones, but I understand that ravens are uh, a significant part of the story. And then there's the raven god Odin. And this is a, just a rather remarkable uh, tale this object that we see here, uh, this is Odin, they believe is Odin. And then over here is a raven. And over here is a raven. Two, here are two heads of animals. This is only two centimeters high and it weighs nine grams. It's extremely tiny. And it was found uh, uh, around 2000 in a Viking um, a Viking area, uh, old Viking, um, remains in an archaeological dig. So the two ravens at his side um, are known to be Hugin, which is thought, and Munin, which is mind and memory. And the legend has it that every morning these two ravens would fly around the world before returning to Olden's shoulder and then to whisper everything that they saw in their journey. So to me, just such an interesting way of thinking about things and how the raven was valued in a way. So Stephen Moss is British and he has a section in chapter one about the raven masters and the ravens in the Tower of London, and he goes into some length about some of the myths that are uh, associated with ravens there. For example, if the ravens ever left the Tower of London, England would be at risk. And that tr proved not to be the case during World War II when the ravens were gone from the Tower of London. And excuse me for that phone and the British were able to survive World War II. This is a picture of the newest Ravens master. His name is Barney Chandler and he started either late 2023 or this year 2024. Um, the former Raven master Christopher Scaife uh, wrote a book called The Raven Master, which has uh, been popular and considered to be very good. The Raven Master does live in the Tower of London. And uh, one thing Christopher said about it is the ravens are wild. They cannot be tamed. Well, chapter two is about pigeons. And the word for that Moss chose for pigeons is communication. And I like to think of a little bit more as also kind of this GPS sense that they have, uh, which allows them to uh, home and go back to where their home is. 
I will confess that I did not read this chapter on pigeons until last Friday. Um, and it's because partly because I had read Rosemary Moscow's book, Pigeon Hand Watching, and I thought I uh, I thought I knew enough about pigeons, and I, I do have a little bit of an attitude about pigeons. But um, after reading his Moss's book, I have a little bit of a different feeling because he went into some different, more uh, details about pigeons and their role in World War I and World War II. Many of you may be familiar with Mary Poppins and and how the, the old woman sings, feed the birds, feed the birds, and she takes care of them. But I just would ask you, what is your attitude about, about watching pigeons? Do you look at them? If you're birding, do you get out your binoculars and look at them? Do you put them on your list? Uh, do you feed pigeons? And then are you even a potential pigeon enthusiast? Which um, I, I'm not quite there, but almost. And I wonder if anybody has any comments about what they think about pigeons and does anybody else share an attitude that I have? Well, this is Nancy Howell, and yeah, anytime I go out and eBird, rock pigeons are added to the list. So, Great. especially especially when we do our Tremont urban bird walks, because they are a very urban bird, and they have adapted really, really well. Mm -hmm. Some folks uh, love the beautiful colors. Yes, they, they do come in lots of, of wonderful colors. Of course, they've been domesticated and some of those birds have uh, escaped. And so you might see a, a pure white pigeon, which actually people call a, a dove. It's mm -hmm. so white pigeon, folks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's take a look at a pigeon here. And this is one of the genetic variations um, of our Columba Livia. And it is quite beautiful with that, with the sheen of the feathers too. But Moss uh, focuses on particular pigeons. There's a GI Joe, Gustav, who was very influential on D-Day, also the Duke of Normandy, and the one that he talked about maybe the most is Cher Me. And um, the map here shows Verdun in France. And that is where um, our Cherie, Cher Ami, uh, had her last very important mission. This was her 12th mission. Um, October 4th, 1918, with the 77th Infantry that had very unfortunately been separated from the other U.S. forces. And then, even worse, they were under friendly fire. Their own, the other U.S. forces were, were hitting on them. Now, this particular infantry had eight pigeons when they started at uh, to use and they had sent seven pigeons out already and they all had been shot down so they were down to the last pigeon Cher was released but she was shot and lost a leg and the vision in one eye but she kept going back to her law so the message was delivered. It was put in a lit, what they call a capsule, and it was on the other leg. So fortunately, the capsule was contained, and 194 survivors were then able to uh, were were saved. And um, the pigeon was awarded a French medal. Uh, unfortunately, died of wounds later. And this is a stuffed version that's at the Smithsonian Museum right now. There's a book, Cher and Me and Major Whittlesey. And as it turns out, uh, the author chose to have it narrated by the pigeon. 
which seems like a, a great idea. It's by Kathleen Rooney. I haven't read it. Hope to. Well, moving then on to chapter three, uh, Turkey and the associated aspect of humanity is food and family. And as we're coming up to Thanksgiving next month, many, maybe perhaps many of us are already thinking about Thanksgiving and what it means. Now, uh, Mr. Moss did not talk about Norman Rockwell in his book, but such an iconic picture uh, just brings up this idea of food and family. And so that's why I included it. So the major topics in this in chapter three are Thanksgiving, some characteristics about wild turkeys, and I learned that there are five subspecies of uh, wild turkey. Um, they have been domesticated. Uh, when the conquistadors came to uh, the Americas, it seems that Columbus may have been the first of them to have eaten turkey. They took Turkey back to Europe and it was a big success there. And it is a big part of uh, their Christmas celebrations in Europe. There's a little bit about hunting in the chapter. There's also um, some information that's sad to hear about the way turkeys are farmed these days. After they're um, hatched, they move from hatcheries to barns. And there are 10,000, there can be 10,000 uh, young turkeys in 2,300 meters, which just gives them each just one, one quarter of a square meter. They cut off their toes and their beaks so that they don't injure other, other birds. Uh, when they're uh, about ready to be killed, they are, um, they're hung upside down, their throats are slit, and then they're, um, put in boiling water. Uh, fortunately, at least the boiling water is after their throat is slit. And he talks a little bit about carbon footprint and uh, eating turkey, having turkey is, it's lower than beef or pork or lamb, but hey, it's still two times as much as a vegan equivalent. Uh, the current status now, uh, turkeys have not always been in great uh, supply across the North America they were they were harvested rather uh, dramatically throughout the earlier parts of our country and uh, uh, the numbers have decreased um, and there was big concern because in 1920 um, just 18 out of 39 18 out of 39 states no longer had turkeys. So in 1973 there were 1.5 million. There are about 7 million, and that is because of an effort on the part, and I don't know which organization, which agency, but there has been an attempt to um, help turkeys out because they're so, so valuable. Well, chapter four um, features the dodo, and it seems there's a comment at the beginning of this chapter that it's though the purpose of the dodo was to become extinct, which is rather sad. We have here a, um, a reconstruction of a dodo that's from the Natural History Museum in London. And Stephen Moss had seen somewhat of a similar uh, uh, display when he was growing up. Um, they have remodeled it since uh, the early 2000s. But that's when he saw it, he initially thought that's what the bird really looked like. Uh, and then he did realize that it was behind glass um, and it was just not real. But because there were so very few drawings of dodos when after they had been discovered, it really comes down to some artwork that has maintained what a dodo looked like. So perhaps some of you remember seeing um, the picture of the dodo in from Alice in Wonderland. And then we have another painting here that is, it's famous for portraying 
um, a dodo, and it's from the from the mid 1600s. Here are the nearest relatives to our extinct dodo, uh, the Nicobar pigeon, which is so beautiful. Uh, it lives in in the Indonesian island areas, and it's near threatened. And then the tooth billed pigeon, which is actually critically endangered, and there are no photos on eBird of it. It's in Samoa, very remote. They think there are, you know, left very few pairs left, but there are no photographs of it, unfortunately. So this is where it all started, the island of Mauritius. And I did not know where this island was. Um, and it is um, east of Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. It's not that big at 790 square miles, but it had been uninhabited by human beings and the dodo lived there. And because there were no predators for it, it became flightless over time. It, it originally did have wings, uh, but there was no need for flying without predators. It was a ground nester, which is unfortunate. It makes the eggs so vulnerable. Well, Dutch sailors arrived in 1598, and some of the dodos were captured, taken back to Europe. They were put on display. Um, for, fortunately or unfortunately, the dodo was not that tasty, so other birds were used for food rather than the dodo. The main problem with the arrival of the Dutch in 1598 was they also brought dogs, cats, rats, mice, pigs, and they just ravaged the chicks and the eggs. So in about 80 years, it was probably extinct. What a sad, 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 sad story. But on the island of Mauritius, uh, Moss talks about this. This is rather just very, very uh, hopeful. Carl F. Jones, who uh, is the chief scientist for the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust, he has adopted methods for assisting those species that are in danger. And so three birds, the Mauritius kestrel, he has helped uh, the birds grow, uh, their population grow, um, the pink pigeon, and the Echo Mauritius parakeet. And one thing that he has adopted is that when there are uh, such low numbers of birds that you, if you are able to have the good fortune of them laying eggs and having a clutch, you take that first clutch and incubate it and then allow the birds to have another clutch for the season. And that way, that's a start to get um, a larger population. That's a very simplified version of, of probably the many things that he did. He also set up a school uh, on Mauritius to assist with this learning and to train people. And here are these birds that are, you know, they really have been uh, brought back from the brink of extinction. And uh, they're, you know, stunning birds. So... That's a hopeful story, although the dodo, it, it's very sad about that. Well, chapter five, um, the first time I read the book, this was my favorite chapter. And uh, there was so much in this book that was uh, of great interest. So here we have the Galapagos and um, I think it's, over here, there's an island. I'm sorry, um, I have things on my screen, the view, but there's an island over here, I believe, and that's where Darwin landed. There's a teeny tiny island in here we cannot see called uh, Daphne Major, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So for this chapter, the main word is evolution, and also what is the, the theme, too, of this chapter is how there's kind of a myth about Darwin and the finches and the theory of evolution. So let me 
read this. It's common knowledge that Darwin discovered different birds, finches, and the Galapagos Islands and was able to show that the shape of the bill was an example of adaptation to a specific environment um, or natural selection. And if I can, if we can just have some in, uh, messages in the chat or if people would like to say something, how many of, of you understand Darwin's role as it relates to finches as reflected here? Yeah, you can unmute and, and speak up too. If you'd like to, sure. I think everybody's shy. Okay. <laughs> well, I know Nancy, what do you what did you think? I was fully understanding that. Darwin, you know, found these birds and was able to write his information about why these birds are so different on each island that, you know, mm -hmm. evolution takes place and, um, and it just, you know, that's what he, he did. This is, he was studying these birds. Yeah. That was my original thought when I first learned about it. I thought so too. Well, um, that is not actually the case. Um, and we'll just go a little bit through some of the history and some of the facts. Um, Darwin lived 1809 to 1882. He took his first voyage to the Galapagos uh, on the Beagle, uh, 1831 to 1836. He was just out of Cambridge. He was very young. He was uh, 22 years old. He was a geologist. He was hired to be a companion more to the captain of the ship, who was just a year older than him. But that captain was, was not allowed by his status. He was uh, noble and elite, and he was not um, able to talk with the crew. So he, he needed someone to talk to. And so Darwin is long for that purpose. But he, when he got to the Galapagos, he did note the finches. He didn't do a very good job at labeling the birds that he uh, collected. He did, the, however, do some good work on mockingbirds. Um, when he went back to England, um, there was a zoologist who looked at his uh, materials and said that all the finches that he brought back were a new species, were new species. And Darwin had thought they were of various kinds of birds. He thought they might be tanagers, uh, other things uh, besides finches too, but he did not know what really they were. Now, um, he, he did write up his voyages, his results from his first voyage. And in the second edition of the voyage, he did talk about the, the finches and uh, the gradation of their beaks. So he starts to talk about it. But in the Origin and Species 1859, the finches are not mentioned. Now there seems to be a tipping point for when this idea of Darwin getting his uh, evolution ideas together because of the Galapagos it seems to have happened at the centenary of his birth when his son um, made a presentation. And he said, Darwin's attention was thoroughly, um, I'm sorry, I can't see it because there's things over my screen, but um, the case must have struck him uh, without waiting for accurate determination as a microcosm of evolution. I'm sorry, I missed some things. The idea is that his son is saying, well, he, he must have seen that the finches were just a, a, an example of, micro, of a microcosm of evolution. The term Darwin's finches came up in 1935 and it was coined by a curator of London's Natural History Museum. But Darwin never thought of them as his, his finches. 
So, um, so the myth is um, that finding the Galapagos finches led to the theory of natural selection. And these are words of Stephen Moss. In a further delicious irony, it was that false connection and the supposed importance of the Finchins to Darwin that ultimately, oh, I'm so sorry, I can't read the words. I'll let people read that because I my screen is um, blocked there. Do you want me to read it out loud for you? Sure, great. In a further delicious irony, it was that false connection and the supposed importance of the Finches to Darwin that ultimately sparked off events that would, over the course of the second half of the 20th century, lead scientists to an extraordinary conclusion. This was that, even if Darwin's Finches were not the example that inspired the man himself, they are still one of the best demonstrations of not just Darwin's theory, but of those developed by his successors. So here are, um, there were five mockingbirds that Darwin discovered on the Galapagos Islands. And uh, he did bring those back and he did better with label, labeling them and they became part of his information that he used for his writings. You can see they, they look pretty similar. There are some differences in the beaks, but not dramatically different, but the, there are different species. So one of these um, scientists in the 20th century, David Lack, is considered the father of evolutionary biology. And there was such controversy about, okay, you know, what, did Darwin's finches actually prove or disprove his own theory? So David Lack was sent um, by the Zoological Society of London to the Galapagos for that purpose. And he was there five, almost five months, and he studied uh, these finches, you know, longer than anyone else ever had. And um, from his findings, he put together uh, a research paper. And his conclusion was that the different bills that the finches had were a way for the finches to not interbreed. And later then, he repudiated this idea several years later, and uh, he embraces the idea that all variations in the finches were the results of natural selection pressures, the droughts that happened, the rains, the major first step being geological um, isolation, and then ecological isolation. So that, for example, the three different ground finches on one island, they all could find their own niche. They all found their own ecological niche. And then these variations then give rise to what is called adaptive radiation, where there's adaption to the environment and then evolution. So that was David Lack's contribution and then another uh, couple uh, spent 40 years of their professional career um, studying the finches too. And from the 70s into the early 2000s, Peter and Rosemary Grant, and they went to an island that Darwin did not go to, Daphne Major. It's quite small. It's just like about five football fields by five football fields. And uh, they did extensive field study. They brought their two daughters along too, and the daughters became part of the research project over the years. Um, they did part of their work on Daphne Major, and then they went back to their, their work at Princeton. So they had been there for four years and were finding that they got to know the finches very well because it's such a small island. And then they came back and found a different finch. And so that assisted them with thinking, oh, well, what's going on here? Um, there was a, a major drought and the population of the finches dropped from like 1,200 to 200. So um, 
they made really careful studies then of these birds that survived measuring their beaks and other parts of their bodies. But the beaks they found to be just, you couldn't tell just looking uh, with the human eye, but measuring them in uh, millimeters, there were differences. And so it did turn out that the larger males, um, males did seem to survive the drought better than the females. Then it ended up with this great supply of, of uh, men, but hardly any women. And so the women, the female birds then had the opportunity to be quite selective and they were. And it seems that they selected for uh, larger beaks and larger male birds. Now, all this happened right before their eyes. This didn't take eons of, of time. And so the idea of evolution, um, taking place slowly over long periods of time with hardly anything ever happening. It was thrown out right away. So, and we, um, two years ago, we read the book, Hurricane Lizard, Plastic Squid. Um, and we found by Thor Hansen, and he in that book showed many examples of how, um, you know, the creatures today are not waiting for, um, climate change to uh, undo them, they are adapting as we go along. They're, they're not waiting, they have to adapt. And here are some pictures. This is David Lack on the left and uh, Peter and Rosemary Grant on the right. And I really enjoy these parts of our the nature books that we read when we learn more about the people and the research and the, and the contributions they make. Here is the bird that may be it is thought to be the original ancestors of, of, it turned out to be there were 13 or 14 or maybe 17 finches on the Galapagos. So it's uh, the dull colored grass keat. And its name, Asimo Spiza Obscura means without distinguishing marks. And uh, it lives in uh, South America, has quite an extensive range, but you can see how it, it, it's possible how it could make it to the Galapagos from where it lives. Okay, next chapter then is the Guane Cormorant. And uh, the word here is agriculture. So this Guane Cormorant featured on the right, what it is known for, and it has been called the billion dollar bird, is that the guano and its droppings became uh, a source of fertilizer and it was capitalized upon and um, made some people quite rich. So this takes place in um, Peru and islands off of uh, Peru. And the picture that we see on the left is of a current employee uh, working, working there. And um, you can see that after working for a period of time, he does have guano droppings and dust on his face. So um, the guano, when it was uh, uh, initially discovered, it could be 50 meters thick because the cormorants and their guano droppings were in a very arid area. There was no rain. So the guano did not wash off. So imagine layers and layers and layers. So, um, and the guano provided nitrogen, potassium, and phosphate. It made for a great fertilizer. It launched a boom in an, an extremely intensive farming, which altered the landscape of North America and England forever. So it's estimated that 12.7 million tons of guano, and that's metric tons, um, were exported from Peru to Europe and North America um, from about 1840 to about 18, I think, 60, 60. And the value of that today would be between 6.1 and 9.1 billion pounds today. Unfortunately, there is like a, a tragic awful story along with this too. And that's that 
about 87,000 Chinese workers were trapped into working in under extremely harsh condition, 20 hours per day, six days per week, terrible food, perhaps with maggots. Um, their job was to mine the guano, so dig it up, load it into wheelbarrows, push it up to the top of cliffs, and empty the wheelbarrows into pipes, which uh, took the material to barges that could be shipped off then. They had to produce five tons a day, which is about 11,000 pounds. So terrible work. And the mortality was about 35% per year for these workers. They could be shot if they disobeyed or refused. So it was, it was a type of slavery. However, they were indentured. They weren't considered slaves. So when black slaves in Peru were uh, liberated, um, it didn't apply to these people. Now, here's a man, William Gibbs, and he was able to um, uh, manage his business. He had the sole rights to um, Peruvian guano for England. And he made tons and tons and tons of money. His name is William, and he is compared by Stephen Moss to Bill Gates, William, William Gates for today. Um, and William Gibbs, though, turned out to be uh, quite a, um, he was very generous with his money. He bought the building that you see here, Tintas Field, and um, put, made it into a, an amazing, an amazing um, home, household, and it's now part of the Natural Tru Tru National Trust in England. Brings a lot of tourists every year. Chapter seven uh, is about the uh, conservation and it features especially the snowy egret. Along with that, the little egret, which is its European counterpart. It is, this chapter is about the unregulated plume trade. It was a huge um, cultural fashion in the 19th century for women to have all kinds of feathers and actual birds. It got to the point where people would have birds, actual stuffed birds on their, on their hats. And here you can see an example of a of a green hat with a bird on it. And I'm not sure if it's a bird of paradise. I'm not sure what it is. So this was, um, this plume trade was extremely lucrative and it also took advantage of uh, workers and paid people very low wages. Um, and then there was a tremendous amount of money made um, as we as they went along higher up on the on the um, business end. But what it led to is an amazing um, series of laws starting in uh, England, actually, laws that protected birds because it was obvious that the birds were being slaughtered in such numbers that they were going to lose them. So along with um, laws, then also there were organizations that developed and they really are the product of, of women, high society women, both in England and in the United States. In England, there is the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds that was founded and established by high society women. And then in the United States, the Massachusetts Audubon Society uh, had similar uh, start. Um, along with this then came um, out of this outgrowth was kind of a different way of looking at things. The Christmas bird count uh, started by Fred Chapman. And rather than have people go out and hunt on Christmas, it was let's count birds. Um, the National Audubon Society in 1905 came together as a national organization out of state organizations. Then we have an important law, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, um, which 
gave great protection to birds across states and from country to country. Um, the chapter starts with a story of this man, Guy Bradley, who was had been a hunter and had hunted for feathers and skins, but then he became a ranger and became a protector. And uh, he confronted three men in the Everglades and uh, was going to arrest them. And the father and his two sons were there. The father shot Guy Bradley. They threw him into um, a river. Um, his wife uh, was worried about it, reported it. They did find his body days later. Now, the murderer did um, turn himself in, but he said that Guy Bradley shot him first attempted to shoot him so it couldn't be proved so he got he got away however there was some let's say revenge because guy bradley's brother-in-law burned down the guy's house so he lost his life but so much came out of that death there was a lot of publicity that it it had a big effect um I put some other names here of some other people who were lost their lives in um, the cause of environmentalism. And uh, Stephen Moss mentions this 12-year-old boy, Francisco Vera, who is taking an active role right now, and he's been threatened. He hasn't been killed, um, but he has been threatened. Then we come to the eagle, and the theme for this is politics, and um, found some interesting ego uh, symbols and various things that uh, some of us are familiar with. Uh, the president, the, the uh, emblem of the president, the dollar bill has an eagle on it, and the Apollo mission, um, it was called the eagle, the Apollo 13, I think. Um, let me read you this little summary. Eagles have often been associated with the strength of nations and empires through their symbolic use in ancient Greece, Rome, and other civilizations. They appear on more flags than any other bird in the world. The Nazis changed both the direction of the eagle to face right rather than to face left, and its meaning, turning it into a symbol of totalitarianism. And in this chapter, um, Stephen Moss does say some things about our current um, political candidate, and um, he's he lets us know how he feels about him. Chapter nine, tree sparrow. This is about hubris. This was completely new to me. What happened? And I wonder if some of you do know this story, but um, uh, Mao Zedong was aware that uh, there were different pests. There were flies, mosquitoes, sparrows, and there's another pest I'm not thinking of right now, sorry. Um, but he wanted to do something about it because the sparrows were eating so much grain that it was causing uh, problems for the supply of food. So a campaign was started. Um, and what they did was gather the whole nation to take part in sparicide. And what they did was get everybody to make all kinds of noise, any um, make noise and use poles, go around and where sparrows were, harass them, not let them rest. It only takes about two hours for a sparrow being constantly harassed to be exhausted and it could fall to the ground, and then people would break their neck. And so this became, went on for two, two days, and 800,000 sparrows were killed just in, in Peking or Beijing. Now, unfortunately, what happened then was there was such a tremendous response to this that a year later then, what happened? when the grain was planted, they were beset by insects. 
and the sparrows had been keeping the insects in check. The picture here of Cheng So, whatever, H-S-I-N, he is a scientist, he and another man, when this was uh, happening, they actually took sparrows and looked to see what was in their stomach and they found it was 25% grain, 75% insect. And so he went to the authorities to tell them this important information because they, it, it, it was obvious that there was a problem that they needed the sparrows to control the insect population. And um, this man was, his advice was taken at some level and they stopped killing the sparrows. However, this man was put in prison and his life was made miserable. He was not able to do a lot of his scientific work and um, his life was made miserable. It wasn't until Mao Zedong died many years later that he was able to um, gain some sort of life again, but he, it is said that he never quite recovered. Um, along with this in this chapter is quite interesting. In Australia, there was a similar kind of action against emus because they were uh, eating the crops. And more than that, the emus being so big would break fences and trample things. And so the army was brought in and machine guns, and there was an attempt to um, to call the emus. And um, it may seem, it does seem even a little bit humorous because the emus spread out and they were able, many of them were able to escape. And then a short time later, a thousand emus came back to the area <laughs> And the machine guns were let upon them again. And But what had happened is that the emus um, have a behavior where they do have a scout. And one emu will take the role of the scout. And as soon as they see danger, they let the other emus know and the emus can run away. So there, there were quite a few emus killed with this, but it was another example of uh, really it's hard to fight nature. Uh, Drina, yes. just just a real quick thing. If you could go back to the photo of the tree sparrow. Yes. Thank you. Um, Western Cuyahoga Audubon years ago showed a video called uh, The Messenger. And in that video was, again, all about birds and how important birds are in telling us about environmental change and, and what's happening. But there were videos showing families and whole towns in China with, you know, little kids with, you know, banging pots together and people with flags keeping these tree sparrows. Now, this is not the American tree sparrow, as you can see. This looks like a little bit more like a house sparrow. This is the Eurasian sparrow. But these, uh, you know, the birds would be dropping out of the trees. And of course, as Drina had mentioned, uh, the birds were picked up and killed and you know there were carts and carts and carts of these birds. But it wasn't just tree sparrows that were that were killed because you know, any bird that's flying around and and harassed is gonna get exhausted. So it was more than just tree sparrows that were that were wow. killed. Uh, unfortunately, there was the the byproduct, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, Madrina, do you remember how much starvation happened the year after when when the rice and the crops yeah. were devastated by insects? It was it was a tremendous. There's there are estimates the the low end is 15 million people and the high end is 55 million people yeah. died yeah. of starvation. Yeah, we'll, yeah. Right, we'll never know. Um, but yeah, this was something that I was totally unaware about Me too. until I saw those videos. And then reading about it in here, I mean, it's just like, sorry, yeah. I just had to, I just had to break in. <laughs> yes, no, thank you. Very helpful, yes. The last chapter is about the emperor penguin and the theme of this is climate emergency. And Stephen Moss is very much uh, into the emergency urgency part of climate work. He is not, 
into just saying climate change. We're way too far for that. So I'll be uh, somewhat brief with this chapter because we're um, running a little bit behind, but um, unfortunately the emperor penguin is in a near threatened status. Um, if you, you know, this is, you may know, I did not know how large it was. It's a meter tall, can weigh 48 to 99 pounds. It has such a complex life cycle and is tied in with the Antarctic winter. They do lay their egg in the heart of winter in July uh, in Antarctica, and they only have one egg per cycle. They can live about 20 years. Now, climate urgency, emergency is much more dramatic at the poles as we've been hearing about. The fate of the emperor penguin is now potentially the fate of all of us. As we career towards oblivion, the world's largest penguin has become, along with the polar bear, the canary in the coal mine of the climate crisis. Bluntly, if they fail, so might we. In this chapter, he also shows some other species that are not at the poles, but they have such great ranges, um, or they're like the Quetzal just has a very narrow range, it's just uh, in terms of altitude. Um, and so that's its range, and it's it can be threatened with the climate changes too. The red knot goes 14,000 miles each way. So yes, the emperor penguin at the South Pole, polar bear at the North Pole. So Stephen Moss, um, he says he loves writing about nature. There's something about the act of putting my experiences down on paper so that others can share them. It's a real privilege. I'm glad he's moved from television to writing. Well, um, as we talked about earlier, we have our next book, The Birds That Audubon Missed, January 21st, and The Big Year, April 29th. And you can also see it here, you can see here all our other seasons too um, on our website. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much, Drina. Uh, if you would stop share and then okay. we can maybe see folks, uh, if, if folks want to unmute and be able to uh, uh, ask questions or toss a question to, into the chat, that would be lovely. Mm -hmm. Mary Ann, did you have a, a question? You mean Mary Ann Warner? Is that where? Yep. Okay. I didn't know if there were more Mary Ann's. I, I found this book really um, very surprising and very engaging. There, there was so much science in this. Mm -hmm. um, I. Uh, very sad to see how animals can be treated. It's, it's just nauseating. Um, I'm, I'm really so grateful for Audubon and other organizations with what all they're doing. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you for those comments, Marianne. Appreciate it. Well, I'm, I'm sincere in saying this. I think it's fantastic um, what, what you have accomplished. Um, and uh, thank you. Anyone else? Who here has read the book? You can either raise your paw or wing or hand. Mm. Okay. Mm. Oh, wonderful. Oh, good. Good. Wonderful. Yes. And, you know, those who haven't, that's fine. Um, but maybe this will spark you into saying, gee, I, gee, I want to pick up that book and, and get some background information on how birds have changed the world so mm -hmm. yes already and with yeah. that i think we will um say good night to everyone okay. good evening okay um, have a good evening and thank you for joining us we, well, hope, thank you. Join, we thank hope you'll join us for the next one okay. and some of our other programming of course it's so good you have zoom for us and how this yes. works out yeah. that's a big gift <laughs> thank you it is
Yeah. Thank, yeah. Thanks so much. Uh -huh. Good night.